Take your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 17 if you would. I've got a, I got a heavy one for you this morning. Uh, you know what? That power deal's beeping at me. I better change batteries real quick. So, AM radio DJ. Every time you walk under a bridge with him, you can't hear him talk. Now can you hear me? All right, Revelation 17. Raise your hand if you're going to die one of these days. Now, here's the secret to that. You're already dead. That's the secret. The secret to facing death is to do what they did in the Bible. You're already dead. I've heard from men who in the face of combat said that the key to... Well, one of the things George Patton said is that dead men or men who give their lives for their country do not win wars. Men who force the enemy to give their lives for the country win wars. In other words, our men are still standing. And that's true to a certain extent. But anybody that's ever faced a war, a battle, and I mean a real one, the key to being able to do what is required of you in that battle is to already say within yourself, this is the day that I die. This is it for me. It is, Matthew, it is what I said to myself the day that I faced my own death. I said to myself, Mike, you're dead. This is it right here. This is where you go. You've always wondered your whole life how you were going to die. Mike, this is it right here. And God's grace to me on that day was he gave me the time to have the assurance in my heart that my sins had been forgiven. Because I knew that if I asked, God would give it. I knew what God said. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he said that who's in that day, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He didn't say I'd put him in the line and we'll examine him when he gets here. He said, all you got to do is call upon my name and boom, I'll save you. And there was a man that hung right next to Jesus Christ, that spent his whole life doing everything wrong. And he's in heaven right now with Jesus. He died the same day Jesus did. Died a, a wicked, he's the one deserved to be crucified. And he's in heaven right now with our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll get to see him one of these days. So I'm telling you, it works. But the key is, you've already considered that as of this point and here forward, you're already dead. You're already there. And here's why I'm saying this. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. Let's get a, another picture now of Mystery Babylon the Great. If somebody get me a bottle of water, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> You could run down the station and get me a bottle of Diet Mountain Dew. I'd appreciate that even more. Revelation 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, we're going to focus on that cup. 
she gets drunk by what is in her cup. And we're going to find out what is in her cup. If you've known anybody who's ever been an alcoholic, if you know anybody that has been on drugs or is on drugs now, that once, once they've been stoned and they're coming down off being high or being buzzed or being drunk or whatever it is, thank you very much, um, that once they come down off of that, their first goal then is to do what? Do it again. That's what the Bible says. Uh, I, I, will, I will do it again. I'll rise up and do it again. They're looking for the next high. They're looking for the next drunken party. They're looking for the next drink. That's how they spend their life. And this is Babylon. So you could say, if you wanted to write a little note in your Bible, Babylon is the spirit in charge of all addictions. All of them. And the addictions that we deal with most commonly in this world today, number one, of course, is alcohol. Number two is drugs. Um, and number three is fornication. Those are all addictions that bring about a feeling of a temporary euphoria and once the thrill and the buzz of that euphoria has gone away then they go searching for the next one and they don't just quit not without help not without help uh, so verse 3, so he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And I want you to notice that now. Her cup is full of abominations and filthiness. I was going to preach a different message about clean, cleanliness, filthiness of her fornication, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now very quickly, for we pray, understand, there are two, two primary spirits in the Bible. There is the Holy Spirit of God, the masculine Holy Spirit of God, and it is he that never lies. He is the spirit of truth. Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, shall come, he will guide you into all truth. So he is a spirit of truth. He never lies. He cannot lie. And he can never, ever, ever, ever be wrong about anything. I don't care how many stars you count in the universe and how far back you think they go. 13.8 billion years is supposed to be the age of the universe. I got an email from a man uh, that I've been in contact with that studies things related to astrophysics and so on. And he's been following the James Webb telescope deal. And he said, Mike, he said, you ought to hear the buzz amongst the astronomers and the astrophysicists. They have had to rewrite the last 50 years of their knowledge because they're being shown how wrong they were. The whole point of putting the James Webb telescope up in space farther out than any other telescope ever was to get a clearer, better image of the farthest points that they could see because they believe that the universe is like 13 billion years old and that if they could see light coming from about 13 billion light years away from the earth that they would see the beginnings of the universe. But you know what they're seeing, Brother George? They're seeing 13 billion light years away, the same kind of stars and fully formed galaxies that we see close to the earth. It's as if they were all created all in one day. 
And they're figuring out that for the last 50 years, they've lied to themselves and everybody else. Now they're going to scramble to write more lies. But anyway, let's move on. So the spirit of truth is always right. The earth is at best 6,000 years old. I don't care what you say about that. The spirit, the heart of spirit, Babylon, is a spirit of lies. She lies, she tells lies, and she hates the truth. And her job is to destroy the truth and anybody who believes in the truth. Because you're dangerous to her and the work of her spirit. Now, the very next verse, verse 6. And this is where we're going this morning. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. What's in her cup? Blood. Whose blood? Saints' blood. And the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, remember what I said. We had a man here years ago that actually I went, turns out he just showed up here out of the blue and I knew exactly, I remember exactly who he was. His name was Tim Ward and uh, he lived down the road from us. He showed up here and I said, Tim, what are you doing here? And I, he re finally remembered who I was and uh, he said, I'm, I'm just looking for a church to get back into. He said, I was trying to get my life straightened out. And he showed me he had an ankle monitor on. He said, I've been in prison for doing meth. And uh, he actually stood up and testified one time. And he said, it is an absolute miracle for me to even be here right now. Because from your first hit of methamphetamine, you're hooked for the rest of your life. You will do everything in the world. You'll kill anybody in the world to get another hit of methamphetamine. It's funny to me now that he's actually working for law enforcement down in Arkansas. Last I heard. Once you get that first high, you never say, oh, I don't want to do that again. It's always, I want more, I want more, I want more. And I want you to notice what she's drunk with. She's drunk with the, bloods of the, the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And she's seeking more blood. Let's pray. Father, I pray to your God that you would help me to preach this message. Father, I understand there are children here. And Lord, I, I remember how I felt being young, sitting in this, in this place, in these pews, just like they are. Listening to messages like this and scared me to death. Father, I don't, I don't intend to try to scare anybody out of this wonderful faith that we have, this blessing that we have. These, Sister Lynn getting up testifying this morning, if, if God, if it wasn't for you helping her in her life right now with these other people in the church, how in the world we should have, would she have made it? So, Father, the life is worth living. And the question, Lord, we're going to have to face at one point is, is this life and this faith, it is worth living for, but is it worth dying for? So, Father, give us discernment, give us help this morning. And help us, dear God, as you did with so many others. Help us to not be afraid when that day comes, because it will come. So help us to understand who's out to get us, why they're out to get us, and the fact, God, that you will let her get some of us before we all leave out of here. But if, Father, in, in the rest of them seeing that, it will not scare the true believers away. It'll tighten them together. They'll band together like never before. And it will encourage them in a greater way to keep going. The devil never figures it out. He never gets it right. So bless your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. I'm just going to run through some Bible verses for you very quickly this morning on people that have been martyred, have been slaughtered, have been killed because God accepted them. The only reason 
the only reason why they were hated and why Babylon wanted them dead, her spirit all through the Bible wanted them dead, was because she hated them because they bore witness of Jesus Christ the truth and she literally wanted their blood. Now we have a, a perfect example of this right here given to us all the way back toward the beginning of the Bible. Take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 4. I mean almost word for word. Let, let me read this again. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So I'm going to ask you a question. Who was the first person martyred for the cause and the sake of Jesus Christ? Who was it? Who said Abel? Cubby wins a Captain America DVD. Now, let me throw this in here. Hold your place in Genesis 4. Genesis 9, verse 3. God made a rule that said, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. God made it clear. This Genesis 9 was right after the flood. This was even before the Mosaic law. God made it clear you do not drink any blood. Human blood, animal blood, lamb blood, sheep blood, cow blood, pig blood. You do not drink chicken blood, dove blood, whatever. You do not drink or partake of their blood. It is their life. And you do not do it. He made that clear before there ever was a law. He made this clear. Then he said it again. Leviticus 17.10 Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among his people. I, I am, I've seen it. I've never had it and would not eat it. But I hear that in England they love blood sausage. And it literally is, they take sheep intestine and they take the sheep blood, mix it with garlic, pepper, salt, spice, whatever kind of spices they do, and they fill those casings, those sheep intestine casings, with that blood mixture. I think they put a little flour in it what is, as a thickener, cornstarch or something like that. And then they boil those things or steam them forever. How long? And the, boy, the, the Brits love it. God said, don't do it. Even you say, well, that's, you know, that's the Old Testament law. We're not, uh, I'll show you in the New Testament where God said, I still don't want you doing it. He said in verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood. It is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Somebody say amen. It's the blood that does that. God said, don't do it. Deuteronomy 12, 23. Only be sure that thou eat not the blood, for the blood is the life, and that thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. So any, any Jewish rabbi or any Levite priest that when a, when a sheep, a lamb, a goat, a, a cow was slaughtered, it had to be slaughtered, the neck had to, had to be hung, the neck had to be cut so that all of the blood as much as possible drained out of that animal because it was not allowed for them to eat that animal or any part of that creature with the blood still in it. It was not allowed. And that still goes on today. Acts chapter 15 verse 19. Here it is. This is the Jerusalem council that I mentioned a while ago in my prayer. There was no pope here. There was no... Uh, uh, Peter wasn't the one in charge of the meeting. It was the apostles, the bishops, or the pastors of the churches, the elder men, and the Holy Ghost in among them, deciding whether or not we're saved by grace or we're saved by grace, and we still must keep the, the Mosaic Law. And James is the one who stood up and said, uh, Guys, when are we going to come out with the truth here? Us Jews have never fulfilled the law. Why are we making the Gentiles do it? And they said, you know what, you're right. But they wrote four things. 
They said, my sentence is that we troubled them not from which among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, which means you do not eat the Catholic Mass. Do not put that in your mouth. Uh, from pollutions of idols, from fornication. You see how the two are linked together. Her, her cup is a cup full of fornication, but her cup also is a cup of blood. And from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. Now I'm going to get, I'm going to get three minutes worth of wacky here for a minute. There has been information. I've actually had information. I went through my notes. I found information before Trump became president. That certain high-ranking people in this world participated in the sacrifice of children. And it was a painful sacrifice that caused severe terror in the children that they sacrificed because the body released into the blood a form of adrenaline called adrenochrome. And when this adrenochrome is either extracted from the blood and taken as a drug or just drank with the blood, believe it or not, people still do that. Human, child sacrifices. That it gave them a high that nothing in this world was like it. And when you can get a high like that, do you think you'll only want it once? No. And you know what? I used to think, boy, I don't know about that. That probably sounds like a bunch of internet hype until I started reading this and I'm going, no, wait a minute. Babylon got drunk from drinking the blood of the martyrs. You know what it takes to be a martyr? They don't just kill you. They terrorize you. They burn you. They pull stuff off of your body while you're still alive. And that's why it's still in the New Testament. God said, I don't want you doing it. Now, go back to Genesis 4. Here's the first case. This is actually the first martyr right here. It's not, Steve, Stephen was first New Testament. Genesis 4 verse 1, Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Now what we're going to see is Abel is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Genesis 4, the number 4 is representative of the gospel. Now this came to me last night. Everybody look up here for a minute. You know what the population of the world was at this time? Adam. Eve, Cain, Abel. Who was number four? Abel. He's Christ because he's fixing to be killed. Why? Because his sacrifice was accepted by God. Read it. Uh, verse 2, and she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Abel, here's Abel, he's a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Cain was a tiller of the ground. The ground is cursed by now, by the way. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground in offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But Cain, unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now we're going to find out here in a little bit why Abel's sacrifice was accepted, but not Cain's. The Bible makes it very clear. So we skip down a little bit. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. 
And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rode up, rose up against his brother, Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said, it, listen to now the very words of God. The Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? Now look at what God said. The voice of thy brother's blood. Crieth unto me from the ground. Abel or Cain did not just like choke his brother. He drew blood from his brother. It was a bloody death. It wasn't just the hanging of Christ on the cross that atoned for our sins. It was when the soldier drew the spear and blood and water issued forth. And it was the blood of Christ that offers our salvation. Somebody say amen. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now watch this. And now thou art cursed from the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thine hand. Did you see what your Bible just taught you? The earth is Babylon. Babylon got a taste of Abel's blood all the way back at the beginning and went, Whoa! Oh! I want more. And from that day forward, Babylon is on a mission to slaughter the innocent, to partake of their blood. Am I nuts for believing this? I just read to you the scriptures. Guess what this sermon's about? Martyrdom, dying for the sake of the fact that you're a Christian and you believe the Bible. And you're not going to back down. And you're not going to turn your back on God just to live longer. That's what this is about. There's, there's no fun and games with this one. Hebrews 11.4 By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. So why was Cain's sacrifice accepted by God? It was done by faith. And apparently Cain's was not. It was just done by, I got to do this. Okay? They call that, uh, what was the phrase I heard? Arbitrary contrition. It's like when my mom, I did something wrong and she's, and I say, I'm sorry, mom. And she says, I don't believe you, but I'm going to believe you in a few minutes. And when she started whooping on me, and then I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Then she believed me that I was sorry. She made me, so there's a difference. If you're made to be sorry, you're not really sorry. But if you, out of love for God, go to him and say, God, I have sinned against thee and against all heaven. God, would you have mercy? I brought shame to your name. Will you have mercy on me? Forgive me of my sins. God will forgive those sins. Somebody say amen. That's why Cain, his sacrifice was accepted. It was done by faith. And Abel's was done, I think, out of obedience. And he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. What it was it that speaketh? After Abel died, what spoke about, what was it from Abel that spoke after he died? His blood. And yet it says in Hebrews 12, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And by the way, when they pierced Jesus' side and blood and water issued forth, where did it fall on? The earth. First Kings, Elijah was threatened with martyrdom. 
by Jezebel. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. By the way, Jezebel is a type and a foreshadow of Mystery Babylon the Great. Anytime you see a woman in the Bible that's a bad, sleazy, drunken, whore woman out to undermine the testimony of Jesus Christ, she's Babylon. We call this a Jezebel spirit. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, Elijah had slain the 400 prophets of Jezebel, killed all of her preacher boys, which is a whole nother sermon. But I will tell you that I believe Mystery Babylon, Jezebel's spirit, has her preachers behind pulpits all over this world saying what she wants them to say. And by the way, these prophets got to sit at Jezebel's table, by the way, which tells me that her boys, she took very good care of her boys. They were well paid. They were well fed. They were probably well treated, if you understand what I'm saying. They probably got to taste of every pleasure in life that they wanted, so long as they didn't preach the truth of the gospel. And Elijah had them all slain, and Jezebel said, The gods can do this to me, and more also, if I don't make Elijah's life like the life of the prophets that he had slain. In other words, I'm going to make sure he is killed. And of course, when Elijah heard that, he took off running. In fact, here's another story. I don't have it in my notes. God laid it. Turn to uh, 1 Kings 21. I'm not going to read a lot of this, but we have ne Naboth, the Jezreelite. He had a vineyard. Ahab, King Ahab wants to buy the vineyard. And Naboth said to him, God forbid it me that I sell thee my vineyard. Naboth stood up for the word of God because it was in the word of God that Naboth was not allowed to sell his vineyard or to give it away for trade in any way. It was only to be passed down to his sons for eternity. It was an everlasting inheritance. And Naboth knew that. And Ahab was going to try to cause Naboth to violate God's will. And in that case, Naboth does not have to do what the king tells him to do. What does Jezebel do? She comes along, sees Ahab laid over in the corner, sucking his thumb, crying like a little baby. So what's the matter with you, boy? Naboth won't sell me his vineyard. Rise up and eat bread. I'll get you the vineyard. And you know what she had done to Naboth? She had him hung from a tree like Christ. And now she stole the inheritance and gave it to her husband, Ahab. Jezebel seeks. Now you listen to me. I've been here since 1996, since we started doing all these things online, January 2009. Those of you who have been here, how many times has the devil sent people into this church to try to tear this place apart? Dozens and dozens. She will stop at nothing to try to destroy the truth of God's word from going forward out of this place. And I can tell you right now, I personally know of some people's lives who are in danger of death itself simply because of the work that they are doing for this church or for simply being a part of this church. Right now, right now, this is going on. And I recognize the spirit behind it. Trying to make martyrs and trying to kill God's people. We are loved in places around this world and we are absolutely hated in places around this world. 
Matthew chapter 23, verse 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. What happened to the prophets? Their blood was shed, wasn't it? Who had their blood shed? Mystery Babylon. Why? Because she gets high off of it. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. You know what Jesus was saying? You would have done it exactly the way your daddies did it. And you know what? You're fixing to. You're about to. God has sent a prophet among you. Jesus was referring to himself. The greatest of all prophets. And the Jewish leadership of Israel was going to have him killed and his blood poured out. So she could have another drink. Revelation 6, 9. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, some people... And I love them. I'm not mad at them. I'm not trying to start a war among them. But they have relegated this, this verse in Revelation 6, 9 as being absolutely after the rapture of us Christians. So this right here, that's not a, we don't have to worry about that. And I can take you through a brother that I have through Southwest Radio, Dr. Larry Spargimino, and put you in contact with some brothers in Pakistan who know of churches that have been burnt to the ground with the people inside of it worshiping God and slaughtered simply because they were a church worshiping the Lord on Sunday. You remember the Muslim Brotherhood when the... Um, Obama Clinton administration allowed the Muslim Brotherhood to take over Egypt and they took what Christians they could find even though they were Coptic Christians, maybe Orthodox Christians. Anyway, they took those men out to the beach, stood them on their knees, said now's your time to reject Christ and accept Allah as the only God and there's no other prophet except Muhammad is prophet and Allah has no son named Jesus Christ. Now is your time to reject that. And every one of those men said, I believe that Jesus is both King and Lord of Lords, and He is God Almighty, and I call upon the name of the Lord. Slice their head off on the beach. And the earth once again drank the blood of the prophet, of the martyrs for Jesus Christ. I think those guys are in heaven. They were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So you can say, well, that's in the future and we're not going to be here. I'm telling you, it's already going on right now. It's not going to get better either. I know the Revelation 2.13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. They had a man out of their church named Antipas who was slain. Looks like by Satan himself because he believed what God said. Acts chapter 7 verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your father. By the way, who's saying this? Stephen. And we're afraid... We're afraid to invite people to church. And Stephen is looking right at the Jews and said, You killed all of God's prophets and you killed the greatest one that he sent. You killed Jesus. And he's not afraid of them people. And he knows he's about fixing to die. For what he's saying and he don't care because he's going y'all gonna kill me anyway so you just might as well hear everything I've got to say 
And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have now been the betrayers and murderers. You killed God's only son. So what they do? In the last part of the chapter, but he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they received, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And let me tell you now, for those of you who say, I, I, I just won't, I won't be able to do it, Brother Mike. I just don't want to, I got hit by a rock when I was a kid in the face and I can't, I don't want that to happen to me. I'm scared. I think I'm going to fall away if that happens. Let me tell you something. When you're getting beaten the head with rocks, you don't. Your flesh doesn't have a forgive a forgiving spirit, but your spirit does. And there's no doubt in my mind that God put it in Stephen's heart to say these words: "Lord Jesus, receive my spirit." And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, "Lord, lay not this sin to their charge." When he had said this, he fell asleep. As he's dying, he's asking God to forgive every one of the men who threw stones at him. Well, we know it worked with at least one of them, and his name was Saul. And you know what he did, brother? You know who Stephen was acting and portraying in that instant? Jesus. Because while they were crucifying Jesus, one of the last things that Jesus said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, when it's your time to go, if, God, if you're going to be martyred for Jesus Christ, you know what you won't act like? You won't act, you won't be one of these going, Boy, if I get my AR-15, I'd take care of these guys! You wouldn't do that. You would, a spirit would come over you, and these men would be taking your life and while they were doing it, you would be looking at them with love and saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Lord, would you save these men who are now taking my life? Because wink, wink, Lord, they don't know that what they're actually doing is giving me what I prayed you for 20 years ago anyway. Just to go to heaven. Acts chapter 12, Herod got in on it. Now about the time the Herod king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Shed his blood. Mm -mm -mm. Herod ended up killing all the children from two years old and younger just so he could try to kill Jesus of Nazareth who was going to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 12. I think I'm done here. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives even unto the death. This is what I was trying to tell you all ago. If you will already get to a place in your mind and your heart and your spirit that you are already dead to this world, let me give you a secret. They can't hurt you after that. They can't. They think that if they threaten you with death, that they will be able to get you to trade in Jesus Christ for whatever it is they, they want you to turn over to. But if you've already died and sold out to this world and, and turned your back on it, you'll be glad when these guys show up and say, we're going to kill you unless you deny Christ. Because I thought for a minute you were the IRS. Come on in. Come on in. I've been waiting for this day for years. I get to go to heaven now. 
Luke 9, 23, and he said to them, All, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross. How many times? Daily. And follow me. Matthew 16, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now, those who in those days, and when, this, when this time comes, those who get threatened with take, having their lives taken, those who will say, don't kill me, don't kill me now, don't, don't kill me. I'll, 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 I'll worship who you want, but maybe in their mind they're saying, I'll just fake it. And, and then secretly I'll serve Jesus. Uh-uh. It's the other way around. What you try to fight for, you'll lose. What you relinquish over to God, you will gain for eternity. Galatians 2. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You know what he's saying here? I'm already dead. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in, uh, liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If he gave himself for me, why couldn't I give myself for him? Because Paul then said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You've already decided that you're dead and that what happens to you in this life matters very little it's what happens to you in eternity that matters the most it is holy it is acceptable unto God it is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God It is God's will that some of us die for this faith. I've instructed some of the men here this morning to be a little extra diligent because of some things that have happened this week, one of which was we had... A, a car pull in here in the middle of the night. We actually watched it on camera. About 4 o'clock in the morning. One guy got out. Walked across the parking lot. So we know that they're still selling drugs. In the neighborhood. In the vicinity of this church. We know that's still going on. Because we saw it happen at 4 o'clock in the morning. And while they were out there. They stole Lindsay's um, gas can. That she had full of gas from mowing the grass. And put it in their car. And they took off and left. We couldn't see the car. Couldn't see the license plate or nothing. They do that to a church and think nothing of it. We already know in this world that the lost crowd hates us and doesn't want anything to do with us. And at some point, it is going to turn worse. And it's going to get worse. And there are people who think that they will kill us and do humanity a great service. Years ago... I was here praying one day, and in, in my elevation, in my rapture of praying, I said, God, please, let me die doing something for you. Now, I got a little bit of chicken in me that at times after I've prayed that, Jim, I'm going... Well, God, let's, let's back away from that just a little bit. Because I think that's probably going to hurt. But I'm going to die one of these days anyway. Am I not? And I'd just soon die doing something for the Lord than to waste another day living doing nothing for the Lord. That's not braggadocious talk. That's just somebody that I hate this world and I'm ready to move on at certain days. I'm ready to go. I mentioned to some of you men, I wanted you to, I wanted you to pray. 
Here's why. I love, I love what I'm doing and have loved it so much that I just I want to do it all. I like being part of the music up there. I like preaching the sermons, teaching the lessons, doing the things upstairs that I do, the videos and everything else. Uh, always looking for new technology to use and everything like that. And I often find myself leading the prayers and doing this and that. And I've actually been critical of people who did everything themselves and didn't let anybody else do anything and nobody knows how to do anything. And I can see now that there's some error in that. Because there's been some Sundays that I wasn't sure that I was even going to be able to get out of bed and make it here. And then what would this church do? Just not have church? We can't put it all on John. So maybe, maybe we can pray. Let's, the men pray. Ladies, you pray with us. That maybe some Sunday, if, if I'm just laid out so sick and I, I just can't even hardly get out of bed or it, whatever, that the men of this church could stand up and take this church service even without some big preacher standing behind the pulpit. That the men of this church could lead this church in a church service even without their pastor being behind the pulpit that Sunday. I got knocked out three weeks, Jim, when COVID hit. Three weeks laying in bed. There for a while, I didn't think I was going to make it. And I'm not saying I got a death wish and I want out of here soon. But you never know. And it would be the responsibility of the men of this church to stand up and say, this is our church. Our pastor can't be here today. Why can't we still have the worship of the Lord and hear the testimony of the men of God in this place and let God still move the way he wants to move? So can I ask you men to help me pray about things because I'm bad at ideas, but things that you can do in case I just can't be here. We still need to have church. There's 5,000 people on there right now that want us to do something. We owe it to them. We owe it to the Lord to keep things going even when I can't be here to do it. So let's bow our heads.